In today's video, dangerous fat loss protocols that you need to avoid. And I'm here with Science with Steve, Steve Bogrand. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Paul Ravella from ProPhysique.com and today I got Science with Steve. What is up, my friend? It's been a minute. He's back. Back. I hope you guys are ready for a uh, little Steve Bogrand. So Steve is the head coach here at Pro Physique, and uh, he's also the director of coaching. So uh, nobody better to talk about the science of fat loss than my man Steve. Ooh, that is a lot of pressure. So I want to get right into it guys because I got a message this week from a few of my clients who were um, in the process of getting ready for a contest prep and this is what Steven and I do. We both coach a lot of competitors and we've been doing this. I've been doing it for a decade. He's been doing it for about six years now and we've seen a lot of dangerous protocols. Yeah. So I've got a lot of experience. Steven's got a lot of experience and education, right? So it's very important that we're putting out a lot of helpful stuff. Yeah, we want to make sure that we're putting out information that helps you guys to not only get results, but to get results in a way that is safe and is going yeah. to benefit you in the long term as well, not just the short term. Yeah, you can compete in a healthy, sustainable manner. What we're about to talk about is not healthy and sustainable. So I'm going to put the message on the, on the screen here so you can just see exactly what it was that I was sent. Uh, and I'm going to cut out the name of the person and the team and all that stuff, the coaching, because that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter to us. We just want to put some good information out there. Just cut all my carbs and all my fats today, but I was ready for that. Whatever we got to do to make it to the final look on stage, we're going to make it happen. Okay. So essentially what happens when some competitors are dieting and I've seen this protocol, especially with some of the larger coaching teams that we tend to believe use like cookie cutter approaches. It's yes. not very specific to the individual. They will reach a point with their competitors where they're actually putting them on a diet of no carbs, no fats at the same time. Correct. So we're not talking about just doing no carb diet or keto or just doing like no fats, which also still bad. Uh, but we're talking about essentially only eating protein, nothing but protein. So, and just to, just to put a spotlight on what we're about to talk about, I made a post on Instagram about this the other day and I immediately got a bunch of messages, which I'll put on the screen here saying like, that was my approach four years ago. I'm still fixing it. Uh, tilapia only diet for four weeks in prep ruined me mentally and physically. So I'll put all these on the screen here. That's me still fixing myself from 2017. That's five years ago, guys. So what we're talking about here is not just paying attention to being successful on a bodybuilding stage. No, it's being successful in life. You can be successful on a bodybuilding stage without dangerous half-ass coaching approaches. Okay. It takes no skill to put someone on a zero carb, zero fat diet with lots of cardio. No skill. That's not coaching. Yeah. I'd actually say it, it, it's probably the easiest thing to do is just say, hey, just exercise as much as you can and don't eat anything. Yeah. So what we want to talk about is some of the evidence why that's a bad approach and why we do things the way we do, why we have our philosophies around, you know, what macronutrients, what ratios they should be. Um, and, and it's all founded in both experience and education. So you got to educate yourself, guys, if you're going to get into uh, into dieting, especially with a coach. And you can't just trust someone just because you've seen their athletes and they look good. Understand that oftentimes athletes look good in spite of their coaches. Yes. Okay. I have the pleasure of working with some amazing athletes. So does Steven. Those athletes would look great with any coach. Our job is to make them the best possible version of themselves, not murder them until they have to retire. <laughs> and let's be very honest you're not going to find research on zero carb, zero fat at the same time diets because it's not going to get approved by any review boards. It's right. just not going to happen. No one will approve that research anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So to understand that to do research, you basically have to go through a review board and they're going to look at it and go, Oh, you want to feed these people, no fats and no carbs. And you want to put them on a high cardio diet and maybe too much protein. I mean, I, I've even seen the review board not do it because the protein was too high, right? Like, yep. So they're going to say, <laughs> and there is studies on that. Go, go elf yourself. They're not going to allow that to happen. So what we're going to talk about is just the things that we've seen, what the evidence shows, what the research shows on low fat and low carb and kind of how we can benefit from not taking this approach. So we're going to start with fats. And I, I, the reason I want to start with fats is because they're essential. Absolutely. And I feel like they're one of the very popular things to say, oh no, if you want to lose fat, you can't eat any fat. You have to have right. no fats. Well, we're going to actually tell you why if you cut fat out of your diet, you probably won't lose fat. Why it's going to actually make fat loss more difficult. So 
Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that are going to happen, Stephen, if we cut fat out of our diet. Yeah, I think the first thing we're talking about is vitamins, right? And so you have your fat-soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K. Um, and you have to have fats to digest them. That's how they're transported and delivered in the bloodstream. Um, so if you have no fats available, or you're only having the little amount of body fat available that maybe you're freeing up during this dieting phase, you're definitely not in a great place to be able to absorb those fat-soluble vitamins. Um, so this also has a huge impact on digestion, and I think we talk about this a lot. Yeah. Um, quite oftentimes you get a nice fatty meal in and whoosh, everything starts yeah. moving again. So we do know that it can absolutely I mean, digestion. there's a reason why I yeah. often have competitors eat a hamburger the night before a show, you know, depending on what stage we're in, because yeah. there is something about a little bit of red meat and fat that really just makes the digestive system happy. Yeah. Um, and so what happens if we're not getting those vitamins? That's really what's important. Yeah, so there's a couple things, and I think with the vitamins, a lot of what we see with the female competitors is going to be things like hair and nail quality. Um, hair can start falling out, yeah. those kind of things. Um, obviously, they're used in a lot of other processes in the body as well, but those are probably the big ones that we notice most often. Yeah, so just think about that. Women who are competing, their hair is falling out and their nails are getting thin. Not ideal when, you know, this this part of the sport is unnecessary. So um, the, the other big thing is, is that fat is literally responsible for the hormone cascade in your body. Right, it's, so all of our sex hormones are what we call cholesterol derivative, which means we make those sex hormones from fats, from cholesterols. Yeah. So if we don't have them, we don't make them. We see this in women quite often, but we yeah. also can see this in men as well that, um, their hormones can tank, particularly testosterone for the men, and that's when we see like quality of life can go down, yep. performance in the gym goes down, muscularity can go down, and we see this cascade of negative effects. Now, that also matters for women, but women also have a lot of hormones that are associated with fertility. Yeah, reproductive. And reproductive hormones that are gonna be very important that are also gonna be negatively impacted during this time of no fats. Yeah, and what you'll often see with an approach like this, a terrible approach like this, is the coach will suggest the use of anabolics um, to kind of prevent muscle loss, but you wouldn't need to do it if you actually knew how to coach. So the, the, the purpose of taking a proper approach to coaching is that you wanna get an athlete on stage the healthiest they can be with as much muscle as possible, okay? And so, no fats, no bueno. Like, so let's talk a little bit about our thresholds for fats. I mean, for me, I get nervous around 35 grams of fat for women. Yeah, and I think 35 grams of fat is pretty much my hard line. Um, yeah. I may do a 30 gram day if it's a refeed, but it's absolutely never right. a regular thing. Um, and I really don't even like going down to 35. I would say, as of recently, yeah. I've been very, very aware, like I haven't gone past 40 with anyone yet. Yeah, so we'll talk about what we do in lieu of that because obviously when you're trying to lose body fat, you need to create that energy balance deficit, right? So how do we do that if we're not taking fat super low? We'll talk about that towards the end, but now let's get a little bit into no carbs because I mean, carbs are kind of associated with body fat and, and I hate this. I hate this because what most people associate as carbohydrates are actually foods that are higher in calories and fat. For sure, like everybody says, pizza is high carb. No. Like, I mean, pizza has carbs, yeah. but a pizza is high fat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're dealing with cheese and you're dealing with sauces and breads and butters and things Fatty like that. Fatty meats. Yeah, so yeah. when we're talking about carbohydrates, we're talking about rice, we're talking about potatoes, and you cannot get fat eating just potatoes and just rice, okay? You have to have a caloric surplus. So what are carbs valuable for so Even. carbs are valuable for a whole slew of things what i will say is if you're just doing low carbs mm -hmm. we can talk about ketogenic diets and that yep. can be a good idea but we do still want to understand the role that carbohydrates play which for performance very important it's all of our like muscle building exercises going to be carbohydrate based in terms of our performance there they also help to reduce muscle breakdown which means particularly if you're listening to us, you're probably worried about muscle, how much you are building or keeping. Um, carbs are a very important part of that. They're half of the game essentially in terms of how much muscle we keep. Yeah. So super crazy important there. Um, and then I think what we oftentimes see, and normally I know you know this too, when I cut carbs below a certain point, everything in life gets rough for that yeah. individual. You don't move around as much, general fatigue, just everything stinks. 
I don't even think straight when I'm super low carb, yeah. right? The brain uses glucose as fuel. Yeah. So carbohydrates are important for a whole slew of things as well. Yeah. Uh, and then of course fiber, um, because when we say no carbs, remember there is a delineation between no carbs and veggies only. Yeah, so what I'm talking about is what I've heard people being put on a chicken only or a fish only diet. So they're getting actually, they're not on a no carb diet, but eat as many veggies as you want because that's actually got carbs in it. Right, because if you're eating veggies, you're at least still getting a lot of micronutrients there. Yeah. We're talking zero carbs. Yeah. No. Very dangerous. So, you know, when I think of carbohydrates, um, what I really think of is performance in the gym. Like he said, I think of brain function. And so even if we're going to get aggressive with carbohydrates, which for me, is about 10 times the person's body weight in pounds in carbohydrates, right? So if, if someone weighs 100 pounds, when they get to 100 grams of carbs, I would say that's about where I start to go, okay, we're probably gonna need a refeed. If not one refeed, multiple refeeds per week, where we're bumping up the carbs by 80 to 100% a couple days per week. We, we can even talk on another video about what diet breaks um, can help us with as, as far as a full week of recovery. But by restoring that glycogen a couple times throughout the week, you're going to allow better performance in the gym, prevent muscle breakdown, and you're also, whenever we're talking about an athlete, it's not just the physiology, it's the psychology. The athlete is going to look better and feel better in the gym for a couple days and really get a good sense and feel positive about what's happening. And it's so one we don't talk about. When you feel like garbage and you're training all the time, your injury likelihood is up. So making sure that we're having carbohydrates and fats and we're able to perform well and do our job in the gym also helps to reduce that risk of injury. Yeah, so if you see this approach common with someone and then their athletes are getting hurt, it's it's probably not disconnected. Yeah. There's probably a likelihood that there's a connection there. You need to be taking care of your body. And also, when your carbohydrates are higher on a refeed day, what often happens is your meat goes up, your non-exercise, you actually have energy to go take care of your chores, do laundry, get caught up on life, be social, be a parent, be a friend, be a son or daughter, because that's a part of this process too. We should not be looking at contest prep as putting ourselves in a bubble, avoiding the world, getting on stage, getting a trophy. If you do that, it's not going to be a sustainable sport for you. And it's certainly not necessary. And we've had people compete and succeed at the highest level of the sport, and it is very unnecessary to do that. All right, so let's talk a little bit now about the no sodium approach, because this is probably the next most common thing I see is, okay, let's just remove all the sodium from our diets. Um, and let's talk about why someone would do that. Uh, so I think a lot of the times it's this perpetuated myth that um, you're going to drop water, it's going to dry you out somehow, yep. right? Um, there's also been probably a lot of negative association with sodium just because of uh, people with blood pressure issues, people yeah. who are maybe in some more at-risk populations, but we're obviously talking about healthy individuals that are active. Um, they would be healthy. <laughs> <laughs> right, Other, otherwise. Uh, so it always comes for the bodybuilding scene to dry you out, right? Yeah, um, which but, I, but, but the approach that I'm talking about is even at the beginning of prep, their meal plans state no flavors, no sodium uh, added, any of that stuff. And oh I've seen gosh. I've seen immediately people, you'll drop a lot of weight right away. Of course. Because you pull all the sodium out of your body, the fluid retention that goes along with that, and you'll say, wow, I dropped six pounds this week. That's just dehydration though. Yeah. Um, and people will do the same thing with like Epsom salt baths, sauna, yeah. that kind of yeah. stuff. They feel good because this number on the scale goes down. Yeah. But you're not actually burning the body fat and getting rid of what you really want to get rid of. No, and if it's something about making weight, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about long periods sustained with very low sodium. There can be some negative health consequences and that's what we want to talk about. Yeah, and so the reason for me, I talk about sodium all the time. So if you guys ever go to my channel, you follow me, you know I talk about water and sodium on a consistent basis. And it's because it's so important. So we talk about blood pressure, we talk about blood volume. Very, very important that we have water and sodium for those things. Remember, sodium brings water with it. It's also really important, not only for the blood volume, which has a slew of real health implications that we want to be aware of, um, we need sodium for muscle function. Sodium is what creates the electrical impulses that make our muscles move. And I'm not only talking about our biceps and triceps and delts, I'm talking about our hearts, and our lungs, everything in our body. We have to have those electrolyte balances correct. So let's talk about a baseline level for sodium. Where should your sodium be on a daily basis? So for me, I always like to be at two grams a day as kind of a minimum for anybody yep. that's reasonably active. Yep. Um, yep. I think that's 
a nice place to be. Obviously, if you're somebody who's in a disease state and you're a different consideration, talk to your doctor. But for a normal, healthy individual, and a specifically active individuals, I like two grams as a bottom end. Yeah, and I've had clients report between seven and 10 grams, or seven to 10,000 milligrams a day. And that's just because the foods they use, the ingredients they use have a lot of sodium. Now, for, for coaches, it's important that we pay attention to that because your body adapts to that level and you need to keep those levels to keep a certain look. But when we're talking about functioning throughout the process of prep, if you're on no fat, no carbs, no sodium, it's gonna negatively impact you outside of the gym as well as in the gym. And yeah. we're talking about possible long-term health implications. Have you recently heard of any bodybuilders having heart problems? You know, like it's not an uncommon thing that we see at bodybuilding shows, girls passing out backstage, you know, arrhythmias, things with hearts, uh, you know, people cramping up on stage, it's all related. So certainly if you're removing sodium or water from your body, you need to be very careful. That is very dangerous especially at the early stages of prep. There is no reason to restrict sodium. You should enjoy your food. You should flavor it to, to taste. And that's gonna help us with these things because these are the results of what happens if you take an approach to prep that is, I, you know, I, I don't wanna say it's dangerous as I'll far as, dangerous. It, it's dangerous, but I'll just say it's not optimal, okay? And a lot of people will work with someone that, that takes these approaches because they've had a lot of competitors have success Take a look at their history with those competitors. Yeah. Do they stick around? Do they continue competing? Do they get to the stage, get a trophy, get a pro card, and disappear from the sport for four or five years? That's the post that you saw. And I didn't put any names in there, but you would know who some of them are. Yeah. And they stop competing for these reasons because they associate that with prep. Right, and it's not even just that too. It's then the idea that a lot of times you're left with, where do I go from here? Yep. And well, when you've been that restricted, you overeat and you gain weight rapidly so back. that's the first thing we'll talk about. I mean, imagine not eating anything but tilapia for weeks at a time. Uh, the urge to binge is gonna be through the roof um, because your brain is in survival mode and it's gonna want you to overeat. You're not, your hunger signals are gonna be off. You're not gonna be able to stop yourself from eating. So you're gonna actually start to develop some eating disorder behaviors, even if you had none before. Right. And, you know, to be fair, I'm sure a lot of, clinicians would probably say eating only protein would probably also constitute as an eating disorder behavior. Yes, so even going into it, you're, you're, you're probably <laughs> clinically, but you would say, I'm doing a bodybuilding show and this is what winners do to win. False, that's not what they need to do to win. So let's right. talk a little bit about, uh, you know, fertility is a big one because, you know, we coach a lot of female competitors and what do you want to do with your life after competing? What do you want to do in five years, 10 years from now? You know, if you're talking about something that can harm you long term, you're doing it by taking this approach. Yeah, remember, um, all of your sex hormones are being negatively impacted here. Uh, now, a lot of times they can restore themselves with time, but we don't want to purposely put ourselves in a place where we're doing more negatives. And as you said, a lot of these individuals who are utilizing these kinds of protocols are also trying to use other substances to yeah. then back that up to cover up our mass effects, yeah. which can subsequently make those same hormonal issues even more detrimental. Yeah, and so the last thing I wanna talk about is what happens when you go through this process, you diet down, you get on stage, maybe you even succeed, you gain a lot of body fat because obviously you're, you need to to get back to healthy and you try to go lose weight again, it doesn't work. Um, and this is where we run into people that, you know, two, three years after competing, they're still higher in body fat and lower in muscle than they were prior to ever trying to do a bodybuilding competition. Yeah. And this is unnecessary, guys. So uh, I want to thank you guys for your time. I would love to hear your comments and questions below. If there's any more nuances to these topics you'd like to hear, I want to keep this video eh, under 20.